the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. I'm your host, John Ross, joined this week by Evan Burnick of the Institute for Justice's Center for Judicial Engagement and special guest and constitutional litigator extraordinaire, Robert Fromer. This week on the show, sex offender restrictions, the right to a speedy trial, and the mysterious stingray makes its first appearance in the federal circuits. Evan, kick us off. So this case comes out of the Fourth Circuit, and it involves a North Carolina statute that puts a variety of registration requirements and restrictions on the movement of people who have committed sex offenses, including both people who have committed violent sex offenses and people who have had relations with people who are under the statutory limits. Um, In particular, you have a bunch of individuals who are challenging this statute on the grounds that it fails to specify uh, with sufficient care exactly where people can go and where they can be at any particular point in time uh, to the point where people are discouraged from going to church, from uh, going to uh, their local legislature, or generally moving around without concerns that they will come under um, uh, the restrictions of the law. And so this is both a 14th Amendment challenge. It's a challenge that the statute is unconstitutionally vague. And it's a First Amendment challenge, arguing that it places an undue or constitutionally improper burden on people's First Amendment rights to speak and to exercise their religion. Rob, tell us about some of the plaintiffs and their stories. Well, in the case, you had a variety of plaintiffs, some of which had been convicted of some violent sexual offenses against uh, other adults, some of whom were against children, uh, against minors, uh, but weren't violent. And what was really happening in this case is the basis of like, you had a lot of people who might have had offenses against adults, uh, but, but who were being kept away from places where children were uh, being cared for, even though there was no uh, reason to think possibly that those people, just because they offended against an adult, would be similarly uh, predatory against a child. So, for instance, one plaintiff was afraid to go to church because there were youth services held at the church, but he wasn't an offender against children. Exactly. And so what the Fourth Circuit said there is this is offending, this is causing people to not go to these places uh, that where they would engage in First Amendment activities. Government, what's your evidence? What's your evidence that adult people who offended against adults would be a threat to children? And what I think is amazing in this case is that the government just simply completely fell down on the job. It refused to offer any evidence. And the district court was pleading with it over and over again. Give us something. Give us some evidence. And the government just said, nope, I'm the government. Don't have to do that. I can just appeal to logic and common sense. Well, they were up for a rude awakening at the Fourth Circuit. Right. So the governments, despite the judge, uh, district court's prompting, could only offer anecdotes and references to cases that were easily distinguishable. Uh, so you have a twofold problem. One, the statute isn't precise enough. It refers to things like reg- uh, regularly scheduled activities um, or at any place where minors might gather, which puts people not sufficiently on notice exactly what activities are regularly scheduled. What does that mean? The statute doesn't provide any specific examples of how regular it needs to be, fixed intervals, how many people, what places qualify. There's no explicit statutory definition. And second, to the extent that this does burden First Amendment activities, it's not sufficiently narrowly tailored. The government was unable to produce anything other than um, a few cases and appeals to common sense rather than any empirical proof, and you can't do that in the First Amendment context. You shouldn't be able to do it in any context, but particularly in the context of a statute that uh, burdens what the Supreme Court has recognized to be a fundamental right. You need to show tailoring and you need to adduce evidence. You need to pass the test of judicial engagement. Rob? And we see this all the time in uh, cases where the government, even when it has a speech burden, will simply say, well, it's just common sense that this uh, is involved, uh, uh, that this uh, protects the public. And again, the district court uh, in the case kept asking the government, just put something forward, just put forward some evidence. The, gar- the district court and the fourth, of, uh, the fourth Circuit were bending over backwards in some way to just say, give us something to work with. And the government just seemed to refuse. And as to the other restriction about the, which was a subject to the vagueness challenge, uh, the government asked the court, well, 
The other restrictions that are in the code, they have examples. Let's just pull those over and use them for this challenge section. And the Fourth Circuit, to its credit, said, no, we can't do that. We're not going to bend the rules for the government. Uh, When the legislature doesn't put in a list of examples like this, it means that that was a deliberate omission. And we're not going to basically rewrite the rules, government, because you got caught with a law that is unconstitutionally vague. I didn't quite follow what you meant when when you said they brought examples from one area of the statute into the other. Sure. And the first section of the statute, they list things like schools, churches, specific places where people uh, where you wouldn't be able to operate, where you wouldn't be able to go. But the challenge section says, quote, at any place where minors gather for regularly scheduled educational, recreational, or social programs. It doesn't have any list. And the government said, well, let's just take the list from another section and use it here. And the Fourth Circuit said, we can't do that. When the legislature deliberately does not include a list of examples, we can't go be making up the facts and pulling things over in order to save your law from constitutional challenge. And there's a final point worth emphasizing here. The court acknowledges, as anyone must acknowledge, that it's a legitimate, constitutionally proper thing for the government to do to protect people from potential sex offenses. That's not at issue here. The question is how, uh, to what extent has the government tailored its means to that conceitedly proper end? Because at a certain point, if the means isn't sufficiently well tailored, you can infer that the stated purpose is not actually that. This isn't just designed to protect people from dangerousness. It's designed, in effect, to exclude these people from polite society because they are perceived to be beyond the pale and beyond redemption. And that is not a constitutionally legitimate end. Okay, let's move on to the next case, which comes out of the Seventh Circuit. Rob? Okay, this case involves an individual named Damian Patrick. Damian wasn't the best best guy in the world. He had been arrested and put in jail before, and he was out on parole. And the government says he wasn't living up to all the ends of his bargain on parole. Okay, that happens sometimes. So next thing that happens, they go get an arrest warrant. All right, they're going to arrest him, bring him back in. But now they need to find the guy. How do we find him? So the government asks for a warrant to help us to help the government locate the guy. The government, the judge gives them a warrant and says, you can go to the cell phone, to the cell phone provider and get information about where he is. That doesn't seem to be what they did. Instead, what they did uh, is use a device called a Stingray, which simulates a cell phone tower and actually causes people's cell phones to latch onto it and start transmitting information to it, in effect telling you exactly where that phone is. And that's what they used. And they kept lying about this. They kept obfuscating and putting, telling people, uh, refusing to say how they found uh, Mr. Patrick. Eventually, once it gets up to the Seventh Circuit, the government finally admits that it's a stingray, which raises a whole host of constitutional questions, questions that the panel seemed to want to duck. Yeah, so this case seems straightforward at first. You not only have probable cause, you have not one warrant, but two warrants. The problem is that the Fourth Amendment, among other things, is designed to limit police discretion and to ensure that to the extent that they go before the court and a magistrate issues a warrant, that warrant sets the terms under which police officers can proceed against individuals. Here, the government secured a warrant that was limited to one means of finding an individual, meaning uh, using the cell tower locations. Instead, the government affirmatively lied to the court and used a different means to find that individual and kept the court in the dark. And at the point, at this point, even at the federal courts of appeal level, we don't actually know the extent of the technology um, that they used, uh, whether it simply identified the location of this individual or also um, revealed the content of what was in his phone and the contents and information held by any number of other people who might have keyed into the cell phone tower. So the question is whether, despite the fact that there are a couple of warrants and there's probable cause, the police have abused their discretion under the warrant that they were given to go beyond the scope of that, which, if true, would violate the Fourth Amendment. Well, he's guilty. Well, he might be guilty, but that's what the Fourth Amendment isn't about, whether a person's guilty or innocent. It's about limiting the government's power to unreasonably intrude in our lives. And these stingray te- the Stingray technology, as the dissent points out, is quite troubling because it latches on to your cell phone and 
makes your cell phone think that it is connecting to a real cell phone tower, it will cause your cell phone to send information. You can do things with these stingrays like intercept text, text messages, phone calls, possibly get access to the inner, inner workings of your phone. And that's the because that of that deep concern about privacy, that's why the courts need to know about this. But the majority in this case said, well, the guy was guilty and he was on a public street. So basically, who cares how they found him? Uh, which might be all well and good for this particular case. But because this technology is so important, there was a very strong dissent saying, no, we need to get to the bottom of this technology and find out what it's really able to do. And so I would expect, uh, given how important this uh, issue is and how many times it's going to come up in federal courts in uh, the months and years to come, that this case probably uh, would be a strong candidate for en banc review, where the full Seventh Circuit would really sort of start to weigh in on this, to really start inspecting uh, what does this technology do and what kind of threat is, does it create to people's privacy. Yeah, the most striking distinction from the purposes of judicial engagement versus judicial abdication between the majority and the dissent is the degree to which the majority simply takes at face value the government's representations about the nature of this technology, despite the fact that the government has already lied to the courts, uh, to the district courts, about the way that it was exercising its discretion. So uh, the, the majority says, look, the government says that this is just used to, to track the locations of this individual. Uh, um, and therefore, there's Supreme Court case law suggesting that location tracking is constitutionally legitimate or doesn't constitute, constitute a search. The dissent responds by saying, look, we don't really know that. And the government hasn't been forthcoming about the extent of this technology, not only throughout this litigation, but more generally. So we need to send this back down to do more fact finding before we can come to a constitutional conclusion. Yeah, it's important to recognize that this isn't the first time the, that police have used a stingray, but oftentimes when it's come up, uh, police and prosecutors have dropped cases or made plea deals just so they don't have to reveal that they're using th this technology to in courts. Uh, it appears that they don't want it exposed, uh, but that's exactly what uh, the purpose of the judiciary is, is to make that inquiry and to make sure that the law, that what the government is doing uh, does not unduly infringe on our rights. We wouldn't have even, I mean, it's worth pointing out, we wouldn't have even known that they had used the stingray in the first place if they hadn't, in response to an amicus brief, revealed its existence. So throughout this entire litigation, we don't know that there's a stingray. Suddenly we have an amicus brief. Then the government says, oh, by the way, yes, we've essentially exceeded the scope of this warrant. And the majority just says, essentially, that's fine, the guy was guilty. So... Uh, you know, it's a very remarkable example of judicial abdication on the part of the majority and an engaged sense that hopefully will win the day when the case goes on bonk. Okay, let's move on to the final case, which comes out of the 11th Circuit. Evan? So this case involves the Speedy Trial Act, which is a federal law that's designed to implement a constitutional guarantee. The Sixth Amendment provides that an individual is entitled to a speedy and public trial. Um, the Speedy Trial Act says that within 70 days after uh, an individual is indicted, he must be tried. Um, the plaintiff in this case is an individual who has been convicted in connection with a robbery along with several other co-defendants after a, um, a trial that was given a continuance for the, uh, for the extent of an entire year. Um, this continuance was granted by the district judge on the grounds that ev all of the co-defendants said that it was okay, and in the interests of justice, given that these individuals might have faced the death penalty and therefore needed more time to prepare, we're going to delay the trial. There are a couple of different problems with that. One, the Speedy Trial Act is unequivocal. It says 70 days, and to the extent that you cr have an exception for the ends of justice, which is a statutorily recognized exception. The reason for that exception needs to actually be either in the record. It, it, it has to be in the record. It needs to be either written or oral, and the judge has to make that finding. Second of all, even granting the premise, which can't be granted, the statute precludes it, that um, if everybody agrees, then the trial can be continued uh, further than the 70 days. That's not even what happened. One of the co-defendants actually refused to consent to this on the grounds that, look, I'm 
going to be spending all of this time in jail. I can't be let out on bond. I want my trial now. Um, and what you have in this opinion is a very striking example of judicial engagement with the um, 11th Circuit saying the district court got it wrong. Yeah, Mr. Amar, uh, the defendant in the case, uh, didn't consent, which the district court seemed to just repeatedly either ignore or didn't understand. And I got to be honest, I, I can't believe I'm saying this now, uh, but I feel bad for the government prosecutors in this case because you know, they tried. They knew the Speedy Trial Act was there. They went to the district court and said – look, you have to make findings on the record that this is going to serve the ends of justice, which are the, is the term in the statute. And this district court judge just repeatedly refused. He just said, well, everybody agreed, continuing the, uh, the inaccuracy that uh, the defendant in the case uh, consented to this. And as you point out, uh, it doesn't matter anyway. But the government kept trying to get the court to say, just make, just do the findings. Just say that this furthers the ends of justice, and it refused. And the Eleventh Cir Circuit, to its credit, it its hands were tied largely by the acts of the district court. But it did not. What's impressive here is they didn't try to duck it. They didn't try to make up excuses or to uh, fudge the fact, the record to say that the district court did something that it in fact did not do. So that's commendable. Yeah, I mean, just to hone in on the uh, the situation that the government was faced with, they're confronted with a judge who says, well, what magic words do you want me to say? Um, thereby indicating that the judge is actually indifferent to the terms of the Speedy Trial Act, which says not only that you need to pronounce magic words, but that you need to actually justify those magic words in terms of what you're doing in the record. You need to set out your conclusions in support of them. But the government says, OK, well, you know, he's disparaging this by saying it's magic words, but say those magic words and say them in writing or say them orally, do something. Um, but the district court refuses to do so, and the 11th Circuit comes to the proper conclusion, which is that the district court behaved remarkably improperly. This really showcases the importance of judicial engagement in what seems like kind of a mundane case, but you need to be alert, even in contexts like this, um, to abuses of discretion by d uh, district courts. Exactly, and it's going to be important down the road because – Next time this comes up before that district judge, do you think he's going to uh, do the same thing he did here or do you think he's going to actually, you know, follow the law? It seems much more likely that because the 11th Circuit was engaged, the district court is going to do its job the correct way on the front end next time. So what happens now? A new trial? Uh, they've got to indict him again. Um, uh, basically, everything that's gone uh, forward thus far. It's, it's what's called a structural error, and therefore everything is everything is done unless the government wants to start it up again, which I expect that it will because, yes, yeah, somebody died and there was a robbery committed. Okay, that concludes the show. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is John Ross from the Institute for Justice, suborning you to get engaged.